we're here to talk about the man who's responsible for our amazing grace. But I want to build a base first so that you'll appreciate the song better because the song's being attributed, I think, by people who are rewriting history, whether willfully or ignorantly, and I think it's ignorantly because we haven't done our work. We need, we need to give the story and get it out there, and I'm just as much to blame as anyone for not having published this. I have given this at the University of Virginia, I've given it other places, and now I'm giving it here, but um, it's going to be left to the young folks here in the um, Institute, perhaps to write that biography of William Walker, to write the history of the song, so that we will give the proper person proper credit. and. Uh, not use the song as propaganda, not use it as a self-help song, which it's become. When you remove God and the Lord and Christ and He from the last stanza, which has been done, Judy Collins, uh, John Baez, who says, I can't believe it's a religious song, when she's interviewed, we've got to set the story straight. William Walker was born in 1809 on Tiger River in the central South Carolina upcountry, about halfway between Columbia and Spartanburg. He was known by the nickname Singing Billy to distinguish him from two other William Walkers in his part of the world, Hog Billy, who raised hogs, and his son Pig Billy. Singing Billy's father was Welch Baptist and immigrated directly to South Carolina from Wales. Singing Billy's mother was Susan Jackson, whose parents were Greers and Jacksons from Ireland. The Baptist churches of William Walker's childhood were Lower Fair Forest and Paget's Creek. The first was established in 1762, so was 50 years old when Walker was born. Both churches felt music important. The church minutes frequently note attention to music and musicians. Um, and for young people who want a project in graduate school, a biography of singing Billy Walker, responsible for Amazing Grace, has never been done. And uh, he is one of our South Carolina musical heroes. So the church minutes do exist, and they have not been used. Um, Perhaps even more influential than the church music was his Irish-descended mother. From footnotes to several songs in Walker's hymn books, we learned that Susan Jackson Walker taught him songs when he was a small child, and he apparently listened deep and long. For example, concerning the song Solemn Thought, Walker says, quote, This is a very dear old tune to me. I learned it from the sweet voice of my dear mother, who now sings in heaven, when I was only three years old, the first tune I ever learned. And in another note, he says that it was the first piece he wrote out, and that was when he was 18 years old. So this is the author of Amazing Grace we're talking about, and that alone makes him so important to us. And the history, the biography, and the history of of William Walker and his importance to us has never been done. A note to the hymn, That Glorious Day, reports that he wrote that song in 1830 using, quote, the melody as I learned it from my dear mother when I was only five years old, hence the year 1814. Likewise, he said the air of French Broad, which is one of my favorite song tunes, first published in 1835, came at his mother's knee when he was five years old. In another footnote on French Broad, he gives further information on its composition. He writes, the words to this song were composed in the fall of the year 1831 while traveling over the mountain on French Broad River in North Carolina and Tennessee. I don't know where he crossed the French Broad, but someone who knows the Appalachians uh, I think a student should try to find that route. I, I don't believe that would be impossible to do. So I would like to know exactly where, there aren't that many places to cross the French Broad because it is a rip-roaring river and it has a canyon. So he was 22 years old and his journey was very dangerous. He was traveling to set up shape note fossil law singing schools to bring a system of learning music to the country. 
to the country churches specifically in the coves and fastnesses of the remotest mountains of North Carolina and Tennessee. A testimony to the efficacy of his work is that the shape note tradition continues there today. A good modern example of Walker's legacy is the testimony of North Carolinian Doc Watson. How many of you know Doc Watson? Yes. Yes. Oh my, now see, five people be the Walker, everybody Doc Watson. <laughs> All right, Doc Watson said, oh, I wish I had the whole thing. He gave the most touching tribute to Walker. Um, he said that singing Billy Walker's music was my early formative influence. And that's my primary influence. So we know, we actually know Singing Billy Walker through Doc Watson. Uh, how many of you know Down to the River to Pray? Uh, if you know Down to the River to Pray and, under, and, and feel, get, get the aura of that song, the feeling of the song, you know what Singing Billy Walker songs are like. They're very close in spirit. So Vintage Walker, Vintage Walker can be happy, but it can be very melancholy. You know, it's very serious and very melancholy at times. And I tend, I guess because of some of my Irish background, I tend to like the melancholy songs. I don't know why. We can return with young Walker on his solitary travels in the fall of 1831 and imagine how French Broad came into being then. I kind of put you there in the creative moment for that song. Nobody else has ever done that because nobody's ever taken this man properly, seriously, as a creative artist. This is a creative artist we're talking about. John Newton wrote those words to Amazing Grace. This song is written by singing Billy Walker along with many, many others. Um, as a poet, good, solid. As a poet who yokes the words to music extraordinary and one of a kind in American history, creative history. So anyway, <clears throat> we're going to hear it. Um, I want to read you the words to French Broad and then Alan's going to push a button for me because I don't know how to do that and uh, we'll hear it. But let let me give you the words to the song. Cause sometimes the fossil law tradition, if you're not singing it and you don't know it, you don't know what's being said. I'll read some of the stanzas. Okay. This is the one he's writing the words coming as he's going over the French Broad River and looking down into this cataract and chasm. High o'er the hills the mountains rise. Their summits tower toward the skies. But far above them I must dwell or sink beneath the flames of hell. <laughs> oh God, forbid that I should fall and lose my everlasting all. But may I rise on wings of love and soar to the blessed world above. Although I walk the mountains high, ere long my body low must lie, and in some lonesome place must rot, <laughs> and by the living be forgot. Um... That's that dark side. <laughs> but if prepared, O oh blessed thought, I'll rise above the mountain's top and there remain forevermore on Canaan's peaceful, happy shore. Then will I sing God's praises there. Who brought me through my troubles here. I'll sing and be forever blessed, find sweet and everlasting rest. These are moving words. They weren't moving until I knew the story. I mean, they were moving enough. But now that I know the story of what has happened in this man's life and how this song gets written, he's out solitary. He's got real dangers around him. This thing is real. This thing is very... Um, not abstract, this, this thing is very concrete for him. And so now he's thinking of his mother, I'm sure, who's just died. You need to know that too. So 
you have that little autobiographical touch. Um, he controls it a lot better than I can when I hear this. I haven't read those lines in a while, and every time I read them, uh, they move. Me. High o'er the hills, the mountains rise. There. That's uh, French Broad. Walker's footnotes revealed the dates of other early compositions. Heavenly Armor. Some of you may know Heavenly, Heavenly Army. Does anyone know Heavenly Armor? Maybe not. You should. 1828, written when he was 19 years old. And it's still popular, especially in Bentonville, uh, Kentucky at the Fossil Law Shape Note Sings. But also outside, you can, you can find all these songs in, on your marvelous instrument. I think there's a music, sort of like a music thing you put in about a database and push the button. And you can get the sheet music and you can get a very bad machine sort of <laughs> version to give you the tune so that you can then do better. But uh, you can find that. Heavenly Armor, 1828. He was 19 years old. Uh, the hymn Millennium uh, was written in 1831. The notes tell us about the writing of that. The hymn Jerusalem uh, was written in 1832. Uh, I want to read you just a few words of the verses of Jerusalem. Um, it's all about going home. It's all about being away and going back. The Irish and the Southern themes. And the, the chorus is, I'm on my journey home to the New Jerusalem, to the New Jerusalem, to the New Jerusalem. You know that song. So fare you well, I'm going home. And it begins, Jesus, uh, my all to heaven is gone. He whom I fix my hopes upon, his track I see and I'll pursue the narrow way till him I view. I'm on my journey home to the New Jerusalem. I'm sorry. It's, it's a song that you'd expect him to write because this man was on horseback most of his young life. He was riding from Spartanburg, South Carolina to the North Carolina mountains, through the North Carolina mountains, to East Tennessee, and further than that, setting up singing schools, one right after another. So he's on horseback most of his life. And that journeying motif is very, very, then it would be very natural for him. So, so many of his songs are about journeys. And of course then, the big journey is the main journey. And home is not Spartanburg. It's the heavenly home. And that we all have to keep in mind. That is our real home. The South is our home. But our real home <laughs> is the home he's talking about. He's talking about both homes. But um, anyway, you can find Jerusalem, 1832, in any number of places. That, that song is still sung. How many of you know that one? I'm on my journey home to the New Jerusalem, to the New Jerusalem. 
Alan knows it. Okay, I wish you all did. So these songs that I want to impress on, the young folks especially, are by a serious young man of the ripe old age of 23. What have you done with your lives, folks? What had I done with my life? <laughs> what have I done with my life <laughs> when I was 23? I was still trying to get a PhD, I expect. But uh, 23 years old, I think that's extraordinary. Of course, you have a great many achievers in the Old South uh, and in, in America because they didn't have to go to college. They, st <laughs> they started out. <laughs> They started out and did things by the time you've been to your first Georgia football game. <laughs> right? Or your first Gamecock baseball game. So anyway, travel, homesickness, weariness, longing for return, longing for a home and not being satisfied by Spartanburg. I can understand that. Not <laughs> Where's the Walford student? <laughs> but uh, the real home, the one to long for. Uh, it's fitting then, I think, for a man who spent his years on horseback in a sparsely populated country. And of his condition, he made the emblem of a longing for man's heavenly home in his father's house where there would be peace and rest and no more trials and weariness, over and over and over, of course. Wagner was the first to publish the song, The Good Physician, of which he notes, this tune and song was a great favorite with my mother. There's another one, okay. She must have been a good singer. Um, or at least she remembered her Irish background. It's clear then that Walker transferred the old world's music to the new land and made something very new about with it. Here we experience what fugitive poet Donald Davidson called poetry as tradition. Poetry as tradition, that wonderful essay that you need to read in, it, that's in Still Rebel, Still Yankees, I think. Is it? Think. Yes, okay, okay, good. It's no wonder that Davidson admired singing Billy. Davidson admired him so much that he wrote a folk opera called Singing Billy. It was performed at Converse, it was performed at Wofford, okay? It was performed in Nashville, and it's never been performed again. It should be. If we want to reclaim our Southern heroes and our Southern culture, we need to perform Singing Billy the Opera. I have a libretto for it, and it's good. I mean, I can tell it'd be just wonderful. It wouldn't require a whole lot of stage setting. Quilts, mainly, okay, real quilts. You can do that. <laughs> and that was tradition in the South. Uh, I'm working on, I'm working on a, a writer named Adam Summer. And he said that in 1825 at St. John's Lutheran Church in Newberry County, where he learned, where, where he was learning about nature by his schoolmaster who took him on nature walks in the uh, virgin oak forest around school. He said, and then we had Shakespeare Plays, this is when he's five, six, seven, eight years old. Shakespeare plays played out on the academy porch there at the church with quilts barred from the neighborhood <laughs> to change the scenes. So when D Davidson uses quilts as curtains and so forth, he really is right, right on as usual with Donald Davidson. Also my favorite of the lot, including Robert P. Warren. <laughs> <laughs> the poet. So anyway, I'm getting off subject here. The good physician. It's clear then that Walker transferred the old world's music to the new land. The opera, Singing Billy Walker, shows that Davidson really understands what, what Walker was all about and what Southern music says for us and says about us. To him, music was, if not the key, a key to understanding the South. And I think we're doing real well here uh, this week to focus on Southern music as a means of understanding who we are, 
what we are, where we belong, <laughs> and so forth and so on. So John, John Donald Wade, I've, I've mentioned before too this morning, John Donald Wade, who was um, Donald Davidson's best friend, attended Shape Note Sings in rural middle Georgia in the 1940s. And Donald Davidson would come to middle Georgia to be with his friend John Donald Wade, and they'd go out in the country and hear the Shape Note Sings that were still being done um, pure, I guess you'd say. Um, and you'll find the description of those outings in an essay called The Sacred Harp in the Land of Eden. I recommend that one too. You know it? What is that in? Do you, do you know? I'm thinking it's in still reference. I think it is too. I think it is. A book that's already been recommended as a must, and, and it continues to be recommended as a must by me. Further recent research has revealed that Walker's hymn, The Lone Pilgrim, uses the tune of a Scottish folk song entitled Braise of Balcahitter. How do you pronounce that, Don? How do you pronounce it? Braise of Balcahitter? I think that's pretty close. But anyway, people know that song, uh, if you know Irish and Scotch ballads. So a couple lines, a couple from the Braise, the Scottish folk song. I came to the place where the lone pilgrim lay and pensively stood by the tomb when in a low whisper I heard something say, how sweetly I, see, I sleep here alone. There's another traveler who's died in transit and he's buried in an unmarked grave and he's speaking from the grave. The tempest may howl and the loud thunder roar and gathering storms may arise. Yet calm is my feeling, at rest is my soul, the tears are all wiped from my eyes. The cause of my master compelled me from home. Well, that's to set up singing schools or go on circuit riding. I bade my companions come farewell. I bless my dear children who now for me mourn in far distant regions they dwell. I wandered in exile. I wandered in exile and stranger from home. James Joyce. <laughs> no kindred or relative nigh. I met the contagion and sank to the tomb. My soul flew to mansions on high. So here's another wanderer. Here's another exile. He's in exile, but he's doing God's uh, will in, in, in his exile, and he's hoping to get home, but something happens, and he doesn't. So the lone pilgrim you can get on that machine <laughs> Too, and hear it. You must hear it. Now, you want to hear a haunting, dark song, uh, but it's you. You know it. Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan that <laughs> that ripper offer of songs. <laughs> he ripped off Henry Timrod. It, so he did it. Well, I bet it's good. It is. is it good? Oh. Yes, well, y'all can get that then. The hymn, something new. And one of my favorites, Thorny Desert. I love the title, Thorny Desert. Now identified as variants of Irish and Scots-Irish reels. This has just been done. I mean, research is finally being done a little bit around the edges. And we're finding more and more that Singing Billy's Walker's uh, uh, songs have analogs in Ireland and in Scotland and, Scot and, and Northern Ireland. Uh, I don't... We don't have time for Thorny Desert, but I want to read you just a few, <laughs> a few lines. Dark and thorny is the desert through which pilgrims make their way, traveling again, say. Um, but beyond this veil of sorrows lie the fields of endless day. Um, oh, young soldiers, are you weary of the troubles of the way? Does your strength begin to fail you and your vigor to decay? This is a long song. It's two pages here in my script. But he says, Jesus, Jesus will go with you. He will lead you to his throne, he who dyed his garments for you, and the wine press trod alone. The wine press image, I think, comes from Revelation, maybe. Some of you know, or Isaiah. 
It's Isaiah and Revelation both. That image of the wine press, uh, it works in the song. But I'll quit here. If you want to look at a poem that really shows how he uses uh, imagery and symbolism, there's a good one because it's a long one. You can, you can explicate this poem in the new critical way, and it's a good point, but uh, <clears throat> we'll have time. Musicologist Dr. George Pullen Jackson pointed out that the tune of Walker's Faithful Soldier is from Ireland. Dr. Pullen listed two variants of it in Petrie's Music of Ireland. Walker was the first in the United States to write down this tune in 1835, or as far as we know, he's the first known person to have written it down. No doubt it was another melody learned from Mama. So many of the others were. Or for somebody at his church. The tune of Walker's song entitled Bruce's Address is the well-known traditional Scots Awa, no it, with new verses. <laughs> and I love his, uh, I, I love the title in Southern Harmony, Bruce's Address Spiritualized. <laughs> for instance, spiritualized. Walker's complete title reads, Bruce's Address Spiritualized. The first verse goes this way. Soldiers of the cross arise. Lo, your captain from the skies holding forth the golden prize calls to victory. Fear not, though the battles lower. Firmly stand the trying hour. Stand the tempter's utmost power. Spurn his slavery. Walker himself wrote both the tunes and words to many songs, but they all have the feel of the traditional sc songs, ballads, reels, hymns of Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. These provide yet another illustration of the Celtic underpinnings of the culture of the upland south. It's not insignificant that the shape note hymn book, the Sacred Harp, would use the emblem of Ireland in its title. And I got a copy of it. It has a great Irish harp on the cover. Works. Walker, in establishing hundreds of singing schools, particularly in South, North Carolina, Georgia, East Tennessee, made it possible for this music to travel westward. It was said that in the country homes throughout the Deep South and the Old Southwest, Walker's music books were second in number only to the Bible. Walker published his own book, Southern Harmony, in 1835 when he was 26 years old. It has an imprint of Spartanburg, South Carolina. It's one of the rarest books and one of the most valuable books you can find in Southern literature. It sold more than 800,000 copies at a time when the population of the United States was less than 23 million. That first edition is the one that I'm saying is so valuable. This book was turned out and turned out and churned out and turned out until the type fell apart and then had to be reset. But when you think of 800,000 copies at a time when the population of the United States was less than 23 million, that's amazing. And there were various editions then from 1835 to 1854. The book was so popular that general stores had it, trading posts had it, which you can imagine. It contained 209 hymns with 25 listing Walker as composer, 25 out of the 209. And he probably did more than that. He just took credit for 25, including Amazing Grace. Okay. So Walker married then. We have him marrying in 1833 at the age of 24. And uh, that's when he left Union County, Union County, South Carolina for the last time and settled in Spartanburg, where he raised 10 children to maturity. He operated a bookstore in Spartanburg. He helped found and support Walford College. Did you know that? Okay. I have a Walford student. <laughs> and this was in 1851. Did I get the date right of the founding? 54. 54. I guess he was trying to get it going in 51 and it came to fruition in 54. Um, <clears throat> he was known in Spartanburg for the excellence of his private library. He had a large library and his knowledge of literature. If you wanted a quote or wanted to know something about literature, they'd just say, go over to Singing Billy's, and he would tell you. So he was, a very, uh, he was very well uh, versed in poetry. Walker always signed his name, William Walker A.S.H. A.S.H. A period, S period, H period, which he meant author of Southern Harmony, A.S.H. 
and he was playing on ESQ, <laughs> and he preferred ASH to ESQ or any other mm, initial. In fact, he was a feisty one. Uh, he told his friends that he would rather have ASH after his name than P-R-E-S before it. <laughs> Imagine after Lincoln especially, but probably before Lincoln. Uh, and when you go to his grave in Magnolia Cemetery in Spartanburg, there it is, William Walker, A-S-H. <laughs> I like that. So anyway, he strove hard to teach singers and singing masters to refine their, to refine their tone of voice. Quote, so as to make it soft, smooth, and round. If you read the preface to Southern Harmony, he tells you how to sing. He says, and he tells you how to behave. He said, no talking while people are singing. He said, this is just bad, bad manners. And he talks about the, the quality of the, the voices he deals with. He said, Yet how hard it is to make some believe soft singing is the most melodious singing. When at the same time... When at the same time, loud singing is more like the hootings of the midnight bird. <laughs> the hootings of the midnight bird. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? He also wrote of the proper courtesy, as I said. He, and this is a quotation. He said that uh, noise while, while singing is disrespectful both to the singers and to, quote, the author of our existence. <laughs> God himself. During the war, he helped nurse the Confederate wounded. Bet you didn't know that. He went to Richmond in June 1862 for that purpose and became friends with Stonewall Jackson, from whom he learned of his mother Susan Jackson Walker's blood kinship to Stonewall Jackson. Now, you know how much Jackson loved music. Jackson's favorite hymn, How Firm a Foundation, appeared in Southern Harmony in two versions. It's called Sincerity in the Southern Harmony. Walker's version has seven verses and appears with a note stating that he wrote the treble in this expanded arrangement. Walker thus published the hymn in the way we know it today, and General Jackson, who loved that hymn especially, thus had more in common with Walker than blood kinship. So they were related through the Jackson family and they knew it, and they had long talks, and they sang together. Didn't know that, huh? Well, we'll talk more about uh, William Walker's Confederate experience because that is so important now in our politicized time of when um, Amazing Grace is being appropriated by people. Walker survived the war. In 1866, he published his second hymn book, this one is never known, The Christian Harmony. This is in 1866. This is a hard time to be publishing hymn books. He wrote and arranged new songs for it, as he said, fresh from my pen. Okay, fresh from my pen. These are new songs. Um, <clears throat> there are 52 pieces by Walker, by name, up from 25. So in other words, we, we've doubled our number of, of William Walker attributable hymns. That's a sizable number of hymns. Not even, not even Gaither has done that, right? <laughs> Bill Gaither. Walker died in Spartanburg in 1875 at the age of 66. He's buried at Magnolia Cemetery. The obituary in the local paper got it right. It declared he was no ordinary man. I suspect even his eulogist didn't fathom just how extraordinary he was. Most people never do, they're great geniuses. So Walford College uh, hosts a Southern Harmony Sing each year that ends with one of Walker's songs sung at his grave. Hymnals of many denominations today use Walker's settings and at last credit his name as composer or arranger. This was not always the case several decades ago. In fact, to be specific, it was only after 1991 that Amazing Grace would finally bear his name in the Lutheran Church hymnal and in other denominational hymnals. 1991, okay? 
And that was just 25 years ago. <clears throat> so, uh, my friend Brent Holgum, who is a musician and a Faulkner scholar, writes in the modern hymnals, the true flavor and vitality of Walker's music is all but destroyed. It's true. They're still there, but it, Holcomb regrets that the haunting, that's the right word, the haunting original beauty of the melodies is sadly diminished and recommends returning to the Southern Harmony settings. So I think we need to hear my second favorite song, and that's Sweet Prospect. If Alan could push that button and hope it works. <laughs> In modern arrangements, this song is usually called On Jordan's Stormy Banks. You know that one. On jo Jordan's Stormy Banks, I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where all my possessions lie. Another song of separation and exile. Oh, the transporting raptures scene that rises to my sight. Sweet fields arrayed in living green and rivers of delight. Those are two of my most favorite lines in poetry. And particularly so for me, because he's describing the river that runs by my house, the Tiger and the Tiger Valley. I look out across at singing Billy's fields when I look out my upstairs windows. Sweet fields arrayed in living green and rivers of delight. So his vision of heaven is very similar to this hill country that he knows in the south, the birthplace and childhood, it's again the imagery of coming home so important to the southern psyche. Sweet fields are arrayed in living green and rivers of delight. Now this, this, re this recording that you'll hear is uh, sung by Anonymous Four. Some of you know a really fine group, and you can buy this. It, uh, you can buy this in a lot of Billy Walker's songs in a CD called American Angels. It's the title, and that's what Alan will play. This is Sweet Prospect. <clears throat> Shape notes, and you're you're singing it through with the shape notes named, <clears throat> and then you get the words. That's a pretty accurate.
If you got two good lines, use them. <laughs> Sweet fields of rain and the green and rivers of delight. Now, the next song is Wondrous Love, and you've all heard Wondrous Love, surely. What wondrous love is this? If you could hear it, the words, when from death I'm free, we'll sing on, we'll sing on, and when from death we're free, we'll sing on, and when from death we're free, we'll sing and joyful be, and through eternity we'll sing on, we'll sing on, and through eternity we'll sing on. Well, I think heaven for Walker was singing on <laughs> eternally, as well it should be for him. This this would have been appropriate to a singing school master who loved what he was doing and was good at it. Now, this business of singing on, we'll sing on, we'll sing on. I want to I want to draw some parallels or act, actually contrast to song of myself in just a while. <laughs> All of you know the Walt Whitman. Mm -hmm. And this is very pertinent to what we heard. Professor so I, I want to take a little time with that because I think we can look at the cultural divide with this poem of we will sing on, we'll sing on, and this, and I sing myself and celebrate myself, and when, and what I assume, you shall assume. Well, there's a big difference there. That's pre-modern and modern, as it's been framed for so beautifully. Everybody knows Walt Whitman. The, the establishment's darling. Okay. His Leaves of Grass is a celebration of the egocentric and even the narcissistic. The poem speaker says he will assume the role of the new Christ for the new Adam in the new land. His poem is the man-centered secular poem of the of the time. Um, interestingly, Whitman was also a wound dresser. <laughs> he also was a, a nurse, and you know all about that, the good gray poet. And for a southerner, the view of the afterlife as, as singing on into eternity is not a bad vision because he can usually halfway carry a tune or at least keep time by patting his feet. All of us are able to do that. <laughs> That's me. Um, Walker was one of the chief primary cultural influences on the South. That's clear. I mean, 800,000 copies. Uh, you didn't have to be, um, well, 
I'll just put it this way. The Lutheran churches of my part of the world, not infected by uh, Illinois and Michigan failed socialist uh, revolutionaries, were very conservative Southern um, congregations. And they used singing Billy Walker's hymns. They may have had a piano, and they may have even had a, a more, more sophisticated G German music, you know, that's a big deal. You know, all the great German Lutheran uh, composers. Well, Walker, Walker's Southern Harmony was used in my church in the 1800s and all the churches in my area. So it was not just a Baptist thing or a Welsh Baptist thing. Uh, Lutherans used it too, and we, we, we talked about that and how that would work. <clears throat> so, I think Walker was one of the chief primary cultural influences on the South and a major gauge and register of that culture, okay? Just as New Yorker Walt Whitman is a register for the increasingly man-centered, eye-centered materialism of his evolving court culture. Would you agree with what I'm saying, Mr. Carter? You can use these two. Let's put William Walker now in contrast. We didn't do that until now. We had we had Walt Whitman, but let's let's now frame the reference wider. William Walker. Goodness, W W. Walt Whitman, W W. Two <laughs> teaching tools. Uh, <laughs> w squared. <laughs> uh, Wound dressers. I won't go any further. <laughs> Southern identity like that of Ireland, Scotland, and Wales is bound to music. Music deeply rooted. There's no better indication of the soul of Southern music than the wound dressing singing belly. As Walt Whitman, the solitary singer, the solitary singer, that's what he's called, the solitary singer. That works, too. Uh, <sighs> William Walker was not a solitary singer. He was setting up congregational sings. He's, we'll sing on, we'll sing on. Not I'll sing on. Uh, we'll sing on, we'll sing on. Um, Walt Whitman says, I'm singing in praise of myself. Right? William Walker sings communally the praises of his creator. With Walker, there's no confusion of who the creator is and who is the created, as we've been saying now three times. And there's no clearer indication of the differences between the two peoples they represent. And this is borne out in the other ways by the story of Amazing Great, which I now will unfold. Okay. This is what basically Don wanted me to do. Sorry it took me so long to get there. But I had to build the base. We've got to know where this man comes from. And we've got to know this is his tradition and he did more than that one song. And it's so natural that he would have done this song because that's what he was doing all his life. Okay? So, during his lifetime, Walker was best known for his Southern Harmony songbook. And we need to talk a little bit about it. Again, what's its date? 1835. Published Spartanburg, South Carolina. That's its imprint. <coughs> the words and tune of Amazing Grace were first married and published in that book. Now, get what I'm saying. The words were not written by William Walker. The tune was not written, written by William Walker. It was New Britain. That's, his, that's the name that Walker gives it in Southern Harmony. But William Walker was the first to put the, the words with the tune so that it's the song we know today, more or less. Um, 1835. Also in that book, Around Amazing Grace on Jordan Stormy Banks, Rock of Ages? Goodness, you all know it. Wondrous love. I'm bound for the promised land. These are the hymns surrounding our wonderful, amazing grace. Okay, that's just to name a few. Here, 
I'm reminded of a famous writer's prediction that one fine song will last when all the grave volumes of laws and histories will be forgotten. I think this will finally be the case with Singing Billy. His Amazing Grace may be the single most recognizable best love song worldwide today. In a sense, then, Walker is among America's most famous creative artists, even though few would recognize his name, five of us, and we're Southerners. Fifty years ago, virtually not even one of you would. I mean, none of you would, probably. So things are changing. When Bill Moyers aired his PBS documentary on Amazing Grace a decade ago, there was no mention of William Walker, which figures. The documentary focused on the life of John Newton. It, you see, John Newton is your, uh, your, your old, ultimate white guilt trip man. I guess, you might call him that. He's a good poet, an interesting figure. And it's a new movie being made in England about his life. Okay, it's a two and a half hour spectacular. So this documentary done by uh, Bill Moyers, I was waiting, you know, right to the last of the five sessions to hear a little mention of William Walker, never got it. Um, Newton, as we know, he was an Englishman who had been the captain of a slave ship in the 1700s. He repented his actions and became really a zealous and fanatical preacher. I mean, you look at his life. Okay, fine. He wrote the words that became the text of Amazing Grace in the year 1772. So that's our date. But there was no established tune. There was certainly no established tune in England. In England, the first time it got set to a melody at all, the melody was called Hepzibah. You ought to hear it. That's bad. <laughs> in the eastern United States in the early 1800s, there were no less than 10 tunes for Amazing Grace, all less than memorable. I've heard, well, at least I shouldn't say all. I haven't heard all 10. But I've got one here, which is probably the best of the lot. And it's Amazing Grace before Singing Billy, the best of the versions I've heard, and it's called Jewett. The tune is Jewett, J-E-W-E-T-T, -E -T. a very good old New England name, the Jewetts. Okay, can you play that, please? So this is Amazing Grace before Amazing Grace. <laughs> it's called Jewett.
Did you like that Shout Shout for Glory edition? I mean, I'd lose patience after a while. I know y'all did, but I'm, I, I, may, I, I, I tortured you with that. Shout, shout for glory, shout, shout for glory. It's all right. I mean, I'm not saying bad things about some. This is not Amazing Grace, and this was the best of the versions before singing. Singing Billy Walker knew that song in that version, and he said, oh, I don't particularly like that shout, shout for glory stuff. And so he leaves that out, number one. <laughs> and so you get a different <laughs> tune. Um, Newton never heard the familiar Amazing Grace as we know it today. He never heard it. He died before William Walker was able to make the tune with words. There were similar tunes to the present one, New Britain, in Virginia, most specifically in Virginia. And one is called Harmony Grove. It was published in a book called Virginia Harmony, but with the words... Uh, there is a land of pure delight. In other words, a similar tune to New Britain, but not exactly, but with totally different words. And it was an Isaac Watts hymn, and everybody knows Isaac Watts. Then enters Walker, no later than 1834. At the age of 25, he polished up and altered Harmony Grove to fit and set Newton's words changed to that tune for the first time. And that's what the Lutheran hymnal say, W. Walker, 1834. So they got it right, finally. Okay. The first publication of Amazing Grace, then, complete with its new tune. Now, this New Britain, Don illuminated me on the telephone uh, a couple days ago. The, the tune is known as New Britain, and he said, well, New Britain, and you told me, I'll let the horse speak from... <laughs> the horse's mouth. He he said about Scotland. Okay, can you say? Well, after the Union, uh, there was an attempt to describe Scotland as North Britain. Okay. So I don't know what that. New Britain. It could. I think it. I think it has some reference to Scotland, because now when we find um, musicologists in England, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, they're saying that it sounds Scottish, and they say, why? <clears throat> so, um, his name is Steve Turner, and he said it had used the pentatonic scale. Are, are, are you agreeing with that pentatonic scale business? Okay, we'll really be able to tap some knowledge from others here because I don't know music that well. But um, <clears throat> the shape note hymnal called the Sacred Harp, remember Donald Davidson and Wade, the Sacred Harp picked up Amazing Grace with the right rendition in uh, the next decade and that is what musicologists say spread Amazing Grace to the north. I don't know how. It, the Spartanburg edition didn't do it. The, the Sacred Harp edition did. The uh, Sacred Harp was done by Singing Billy Walker's brother-in-law, and they fell out. So they split. <laughs> and um, the Sacred Harp then is what is said to have been the means by which the hymn spread to the northern states, where it became associated with the abolition movement. <clears throat> Newton himself had been actively involved in the abolition of the slave trade, so this worked. Then Harriet Beecher Stowe steps on the stage, and she referred to the song in Uncle Tom's Cabin in the year 1852. There, she quotes it, in other words, she gives the poem, and adds a last stanza. That's that 10,000 years stanza. Since I, I can't even remember it, I've tried to block it out of my when we've been there 10,000 years. Yeah, okay. That's the sins of not William Walker. That's Harriet Beecher Stowe's version. Okay. And that's what was picked up in the northern camps. Hymns for the camp, the soldiers' hymn book, issued to northern troops. The Walker version came to England only in the late 19th century. With the growth of the recording industry, the hymns' popularity spread worldwide. Two recordings out of hundreds may be mentioned as historically significant. And this is from Stephen Turner. 
<clears throat> the first is by Judy Collins, who made the pop charts in both the United States and Britain in 1971. This exemplified the crossover from gospel and folk music to pop. The second was a recording by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards in 1972. This recording has led to too many pipe bands all over the world <laughs> making the tune their own. Oh, I'm so tired of that. Every pipe band plays it. But it works because it, of course they'd pick it up. It's one of theirs. In 2002, HarperCollins published London musicologist Steve Turner, Turner's book. It's called, now this is one you buy, Stephen Turner, Amazing Grace, the story of America's most beloved song. And he's the final word on this as far as I'm concerned. He's done his research. Turner related that some today say it's an old Scottish tune. Turner reasons that it probably is an old Scots melody taken to the plantation south by Scots immigrants. Wrong. Welsh, Baptist, and Irish immigrants. But close. I mean, it's fine. And all the people around him may have been Scots. Who knows? Turner reasoned further that the geographical area associated with the tune's source contained a high percentage of Scots and Scots-Irish immigrants. Wrong. Welsh Baptists and Scots. <laughs> the Welsh are always left out. What's wrong with the Welsh? Uh, where are our Welsh historians? The Welsh are always left out of this mix. But indeed, they're Celtic, okay. Um, we might add what Turner does not, that considering the Celtic nature of Walker's Welsh, Scots-Irish, and Irish ancestry, he would naturally be one such example of Scots-Irish influence. <sighs> Turner gives credit to William Walker without saying anything about him being Welch Baptist. He never came to my part of the world, I don't expect. He probably never went to Lower Fair Forest Church, which I have. He probably hadn't looked at the census records for his area in 1820, 1830, and 1840, which I have. It is pure Celtic. Okay? Now... Pure. I'll go one step further than uh, other historians have. That area is extremely Celtic. So, okay, then Turner asked, if the tune did have Scots roots, why was it unknown in Scotland? And that's a real good question. If, if the tune had uh, Celtic roots, why don't we find analogs in Scotland? And he offered the possible answer that the Highland clearances depopulated entire areas of Scotland to America. I don't buy it exactly, that could be a reason, but another musicologist has argued that it is an overwhelmingly Scottish tune because it was the pentatonic scale in a specifically Scottish way, and he goes into 15 pages of explaining that. Turner feels that the fact that pipe bands all over the world have made the tune their own reinforces the idea of a Scottish origin, and we add a Scottish to the South origin. He really doesn't give credit to the South very much in here. During the civil rights campaign of the 1960s, the song became associated with the movement. This was a focus on the Bill Moyers PBS documentary to the extent that one came away with the feeling that the song had African-American origins. Now you can see why this has been one of the arguments. Started with, it may have not started with Bill Moyers, but he certainly furthered it. Turner found it ironic that a hymn written by a white slave captain, a uh, white captain in the slave trade, or would, in the slave trade, would be so used. Okay, that is ironic. It's ironic, but we might add that it's a hymn that was first arranged and published by an unrepentant Southern slave owner who owned slaves and never apologized and never felt guilt about it, as far as we know, and dressed the wounds of Confederate soldiers, which we do know. Now, um, the attempt to write, rewrite history, um, <laughs> the attempt to rewrite history, we'll start with that. Let's hope it's just out of ignorance, because I can see why people would be ignorant of the fact. None of you knew it. 
So it's our fault. It's my fault. It's your fault. We're trying to do something about it. And we're going to have a struggle because it's already being appropriated. It's being appropriated by a lot of people. And the song is big enough for that. But I want to give the man who did it at least some credit, okay, to put the two together. Let's do it right and then let everybody have it. The song is big enough for everybody. But we're trying to talk about scholarly research here and put the, <laughs> put the truth in order. So we have then... A song whose popularity is certainly no sign, it has no signs of diminishing. Um, I've heard it with Celtic Thunder. I've heard it with the Irish Tenors. I've heard it with Celtic Woman. Uh, every Celtic group that I know will sing it, and it works, and they claim it as their own. And they're right, by way of the South, but <laughs> they are right. If one song of a non-patriotic nature is called upon for popular singing anywhere in the U.S. today, one song, it's likely to be Amazing Grace. Okay, but this is only half the story, and I'll be quick. The second half is less inspiring. Turner's book outlines the progress, or some might say degradation, of the song. Turner related that the defining moment of change came in 1900 in Chicago when the hymn writer Edwin XL muted the theology and modernized the tune, moving it a long way from shape note roots to make it comfortable for the new urban industrial middle class. XL dropped Newton's final stanza, substituted the now familiar when we've been there 10,000 years last verse, which Harriet Beecher Stowe had added. Um, until XL substituted it in 1900, the Stowe verse, verse had never appeared in a hymn book as part of the song. Well, let's say, okay, it could have been good, but look what's in the last stanza. Turner explained that the emphasis in the song through the last stanza thus has shifted from God to man. No longer focusing on God choosing people, but on people choosing good works. There's no mention of God or Lord, or Christ in the last stanza now. It's all gone. It's all changed. The, the new final verse made the hymn less likely to offend new American sensibilities, the modern sensibility, if you want to use that. As Turner put it, Excel's change was a key step in the gradual transformation of the hymn into a secular self-help anthem. When Judy Collins, Joan Baez, and Arlo Guthrie were popularizing the hymn in secular circles, the human potential movement was in full sway. The human potential movement, with the words God and Lord now entirely missing from the text, there was nothing to keep the new generation of the 1960s from treating grace as a term for the way that life seems to heal and reward those who pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and start all over again. <laughs> Broadway tune. Okay, Joan Baez, in an interview with Turner in 2001, declared she couldn't understand why anyone would think Amazing Grace was a religious song. <laughs> well, after hearing it that way, yeah, I can understand. Uh, why, why would anybody call this a religious song? And that's why I think it's so popular. For us, it's a religious song, but for other people, it's not. It's a self-help anthem. And so everybody's happy. She was mystified by the assertion. She was just mystified. You call a religious? But this then was the slippery slope from Stowe and the northern man-centered isms and ologies okay, of the 1850s that removed God from the final stanza and made man the supreme focus. Remember Walt Whitman? Turner's volume has an interesting analysis of the difference between Judy Collins' a cappella recording of Amazing Grace and Aretha Franklin's gospel rendition. This is really good. One night in New York when Collins sat in an encounter group when the rage was getting out of hand, in order to calm things, she began to sing the song she'd known from her Methodist childhood. It worked. Her music producer, who was in the group, got her to include it in her next album, says Turner. This was Collins' interpretation of the song born out of the human potential movement, and it became world popular. On another night in Watts, he compares, Aretha Franklin recorded a gospel album live at New Temple Missionary Baptist Church. 
Collins took four minutes to sing four stanzas and repeat the first verse. Aretha Franklin took 14 minutes for two verses. <laughs> yeah, and Turner commented, Franklin's version went back to the long style of the holiness churches where the tune is pulled apart wide enough to let the spirit in. <laughs> I like that. This is our English musicologist. In gospel music, the point is not clarity and precision, but faithfulness to the movement of the spirit. Okay? And as such it is and as such is at least closer to William Walker than to Collins. In other words, Aretha Franklin is closer to William Walker original than Judy Collins. All right. Turner has great and fulsome praise for Walker's oh this is beautiful. Marriage of words and tune as real genius. Uh, he continued, it was a marriage made in heaven. It was as though the tune had been written with these words in mind. The music behind Amazing had a sense of awe to it. Awe. The music behind Grace sounded graceful. There was a rise to the point of confession as though the author was stepping out into the open and making a bold declaration, but a corresponding fall when admitting his blindness. So, one last section on American music history is in order. I agree with Joel Cohen, music director of the Boston Camerata. Do you know the Boston Camerata? Oh, you should. Our music history has been written wrong and our past has been denied. He cited as an example the highly respected Grove's Dictionary of Music, published in 1941. Grove complains that early 19th century hymn books of the less learned type were crude, but did prepare the way for better things, later more artistic creations and enterprises. Grove felt the early folk music was so trivial that he decided to attempt no summary of it. Cohen noted that Grove makes no mention of either William Walker or Southern Harmony and concluded, our official music history has misled us. The finest of the wheat has too often been thrown aside and much energy is spent cataloging and canonizing the chaff. Americans awake, he says. <laughs> The media and the official circuits of distribution often ignore what is best in our musical heritage, and the public has been miseducated to prefer counterfeit culture. Man, that's a good phrase. Counterfeit culture to the real thing. So I'll end with what's not counterfeit culture, but the real thing. Uh, this is a 2003 recording of Walker's song, by our anonymous four again, it closely follows the words, tune, and fossil law method of the original. It, of course, thus uses the proper last stanza, referring to God rather than the 10,000 years version of the modern corruption. And I'm not going to say any more. We're going to leave with William Walker's strain. So if Alan will do that for me. Maybe. <laughs> This is a good version. It sounds more like the fossil law version than any I could find, except at the Bentonville, Kentucky thing, which was so scratchy, uh, it was really hard to uh, get going.
That's the way William Walker did it. That's his last stanza. That's the way it is in the Lutheran hymnal. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening.